I was the son of someone who was called Dihqan. He was the richest person in my city, in my town, and he was the main merchant, and he had some religious duties or some religious role and position. And he loved me so much that he didn't even let me go and mix with people. He kept me at home because he was so worried that something bad might happen to me. So he wanted to protect me from everybody and from every harm. So he kept me at home. He was very deeply involved in what his family was involved in. They were the leaders of the fire worshippers and those who worship the sun. Then they were known as Al Majus. So he used to be in charge as a young boy of keeping the flame alive. So he would bring for it fuel all the time and people worship the flame. And he used to tell himself, you know, I keep the flame alive. I bring the logs, I bring everything. And then people are worshiping the same fire. And it's me who's in charge. A young boy, he was very young. So his father used to keep him in the home and within the vicinity, never allowed him to go anywhere. And he never ever interacted and mixed with people. He says, one day my father was very busy. So he said to me, listen, in one of my gardens, there is some work I need to do and I can't do it. So I'm going to send you to do this work and don't go anywhere else. Only go to that garden, do the work that I ask you to do and don't go to any other place and come back. Because if you do that, I will be consumed by worry. So he said, I went to that garden of my father's and on the way I heard some people a nice voice of some people reciting something so I went there and it was a church these people were Christians seems that they were upon the right and the correct and authentic message of Jesus peace be upon him so he liked the hymns and the recitation that they were doing so he joined them and he stayed with them for the whole day then I went back to my father without going to his garden. I found out that my father had spent the whole day looking for me and he was consumed by worry and fear and apprehension about me. My father said to me, where did you go? He said, well, actually I was going to the garden, but I saw some people on the way. They were reciting some nice things. When I went to join them, they were worshipping God. And I liked the religion they were upon and I stayed with them for the whole day. So my father said to me, now those people are evil, the religion is evil, your religion is better than them. I said, no, their religion is better than our religion. It's clear because worshipping the fire, it's obviously to any person with a sound intellect, it totally contradicts every reason and every intellect. His father, when he noticed that, he chained him and he imprisoned him, he jailed him at home. He said, you can't go out. So he said, through some of my contacts, I sent to those Christians and I asked them, where is the origin of this religion? So they said to him, they are based in a sham. So I said to them, when a caravan comes to you from that land, from Syria, please inform me. Time passed by, one day a caravan came from a sham. He said, please, when the day comes, the day of, of their departure comes, please inform me. Somebody informed him, he broke loose from the chains and he joined them and he went to, with them to Asham, to one of the churches there. And there was a priest in charge of that church. He stayed with them and he said, listen, I came from that land and I left the religion of my fathers and my forefathers. And because I see that your religion is the truth, I want to follow it. It's the religion of God. So he joined them. But he said, I saw that this priest was an evil man. He pretends to be righteous, but every time he tells the people, pay for the poor people, pay for the cause of the religion. The people would pay from their gold and their silver and the wealth that they had, but he didn't give the money to the poor people. He kept it for himself. He used to hoard it somewhere. He used to save it somewhere. And I hated him so much, but I couldn't say anything about him. And one day, he became very ill and he died. So everybody was getting ready to bury him and give him a respected funeral. So I said to them, why do you want to give him such a respectable funeral? They said, he's our leader and our priest. He said, but he was an evil man. They said, how do you know that? He said, because I lived with him 
And every time he commanded you to give charity, he would take it for himself and hoard it and save it somewhere. They said, yeah, can you prove it? He said, yes, I can tell you where he kept all the money and all the wealth. He told them where that place was and they found a lot of wealth, a lot of silver and gold. He kept it for himself. Then they brought another priest to be in charge of the church. This new priest was such a righteous person, I've never seen anyone like him in my life. He was a devout believer, worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, and he would guide the people, teach them, and he would do so many deeds of righteousness. I loved him so much like I've never loved any person in my life. And I lived with him and I started learning from him. Then one day he fell ill and he was about to die. So I told him, I left my father and my family and my country in search for the religion of truth. And I've lived with you. Now you are dying. You know, tell me about a person that I can, I can go and join him and live with him and learn from him. He said, oh my son, you know, people have changed the religion of truth, the religion that Jesus came with. And I only know of a person who was in al Musil. That person is upon the true religion. So go and join him and stay with him. Once he died and we buried him, I left to al Musil and I joined that person and I found him to be even better than his friend. More righteous than his friend. And I spent a long time with him, learning from him, serving him, and getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, it was such a wonderful time for me. But then time came where this person also fell ill. So he said to, this, to his teacher who was dying, he said to him, guide me to someone. He said, you know son, people have changed the religion. And I only know of one person who is in a city called Nasribin. So you join him and you learn from him. So he said, I stayed for some time after we buried him. Then I straight set out to Nasribin to join that person. And I found him even better than his friends. More righteous. I spent more time with him and I learned from him. And I loved him so much, more than I loved anybody before. Then he fell ill and he was about to die. When he was on his deathbed, I came to him and I said, I've left my family. What should I do? Where should I go? I need a sheikh. So he said to him, people have changed the religion. I only know that on earth there is only one person that I know of who is still on the true religion of monotheism, the religion that Isa alayhi salam came with. She said, where is he? He said, in Amuriya. So he said, this person died. Then I traveled to Amuriya and stayed with that person. I found him to be more righteous than all the ones before. And I loved him so much and stayed with him for some time. Then after a while, he became very ill. And I could tell that he was dying. So I said to him, show me, guide me to anyone that I can go and join, I want to learn from and I want to stay with. He said to him, I don't know of any person on earth who is still on the true religion. But he gave him a good piece of news. Now it's time for a prophet to be sent with this truth. And he will be set in a land between two hills. And this land or this city will be full with palm trees. Then he died. She said, I stayed in that city, Amuriya, for some time. I worked and I managed to buy a cow and some sheep, some goats, waiting for the opportunity and asking and inquiring to know what is that city, where is it? So I came to know that it seems that it was the land Arabia. One day, there was a trade caravan from a tribe called Kalb, one of the Arab tribes. So I came to them and I said to them, can you take me to your land, to Arabia, and I will give you my cow and my goats? They said, okay. And we set out on the journey. On the way, they set me up. They sold him as a slave. Who bought him? He was bought by a Jew, so he became a slave to one of the Jews. He said, when that Jewish person took me to his home, to his town, 
I saw many palm trees around. So I was hoping that this was the land of the Prophet. Imagine he was taken as a slave. But still his main concern was to find the Prophet or the, that city where the Prophet was to be sent. That was the main thought on his mind. He didn't think about him being set up and being, becoming a slave, losing his liberty, losing his self. He said, I really felt some happiness that this might be the city where this Prophet will migrate to. He said, but I stayed with the, my master for some time. Then one of his cousins came from a city called Yathrib. And my master sold me to his cousin. And who was this cousin? The cousin was from Banu Quraida. They had settled around Medina. So Salman, he decided, okay, I'm going with this new master of mine. Let me go. When he got to Banu Quraida, he noticed the desert. He noticed the rocks. He saw the greenery, the orchards, and he was so excited. He says, Subhanallah, I'm sure this is the place where this messenger is going to come. And he was so happy and delighted. So he worked very hard for this master of his. And one day, Another cousin came in from al Madinah al munawwara One of the Jewish people had come to see his master. And he was busy on one of the trees taking out some dates. And what happened is he heard this man say that, Oh, Al-Aws and Al-Khazraj, they will be destroyed. Look at them. They want to follow a man who's just come from Mecca. He's claiming to be a prophet and he's claiming to say this and that. Salman says, I got such a pleasant surprise. I shook in a way that I almost dropped off the tree. And I quickly rushed down the tree and got to my master with his cousin. And I said, what did you say? Can you repeat it? And my master gave me one smack and sent me back to work. He says, but I heard. They said that he is living in Quba. So that night, very quietly, I took some dates. Why did I take dates? He says, that man in Amuriya, one of those Christian leaders told me that when the messenger comes, there will be clear signs that prove he's a messenger. He will not eat charity, but he will eat from a gift. And he will have a mark on his back, that which will be a seal of prophethood. When you see that, you know he is the prophet. So Salman al-Farisi, radiallahu anhu, he decides to take some dates. And he went to Quba. He says, I saw this messenger. I looked at him. I was so excited. And I, I said, you know, you people are not from this place. I have brought some charity that I want to give you. These are some dates and I want you to eat them. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam thanked him and accepted the charity and so on. And the Sahaba, some of them began to eat. But Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam did not eat. Why? Because it was a charity. So Salman says, okay, that's one, one sign, done. So after a few days, he heard that Muhammad sallallahu shifted to Medina already. He went to Medina with some more dates and he looked at Muhammad sallallahu He says, oh, he told him, you know what? I've brought you a gift because I believe you don't eat charity. So Muhammad sallallahu took it, gave some of his companions and ate from it. So he said, okay, that's the second sign, done. After a few days, there was someone who died and was being buried and Muhammad sallallahu was at Baqiyah assisting in the burial. So Salman had arrived in Baqiyah and he noticed Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa between his clothing he was looking very hard to see that mark on his back where his shoulders are and he's trying to look where is the seal so Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa looked at him and noticed that he's trying to look at the seal of prophethood so he actually pushed his clothing off in a, in a way that the seal became clear when Salman saw it he began to weep and he kissed Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and he declared his shahada and this is why this person was called the seeker of the truth without bothering about him losing his own freedom. Salman al-Farisi, the seeker of the truth. The Prophet ﷺ was happy that his companions listened to the story. <clears throat> now Salman al-Farisi has won the hearts of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ with such a zeal and determination to find the truth no matter what it takes. So the Prophet ﷺ told Salman al-Farisi, free yourself. So he went to his master and he said to him, I want to free myself. After some negotiations, his master agreed to free him if he grows for him 300 date palms and if he gives him the price of 40 ounces of either gold or silver, the narration doesn't really specify. And that was such a huge price. 
but for him it was to free himself and dedicate his time for the sake of Islam. So he came to the Prophet ﷺ very happy and he said, I agreed with my master on this. So the Prophet ﷺ said to the companions, help your brother. And here where the Muslim Brotherhood really shows its beauty, where the Muslims helped Salman al-Farisi and soon after he was freed. And he became a free person and he helped Islam in so many occasions. He was one of the greatest companions of Muhammad ﷺ. But he was loved by the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He is the hero of the battle of the trench because when the kuffar of Mecca, they were thousands who were now coming to Medina in order to attack the Muslims. There was no way that they were not going to be entering Medina Munawwara. But Salman al-Farisi was one of those who said, O oh Messenger, in Persia, when the enemy comes and we want to block him from coming, we used to dig a big trench approximately 10 meters by 16 meters. And we used to make sure that they cannot even cross the trench so they don't enter the city at all. So let us do it. And subhanallah, that was adopted by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Hence, it is called the battle of the trench. Why? Salman al-Farisi radiallahu anhu, it was his idea. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala confirmed it for Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This was the young man from Persia. He has a story with Abu Darda radiallahu anhu. Abu Darda radiallahu anhu was another companion whom the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had asked Salman al-Farisi to live with when they came into Medina Munawwara after some time. So Abu Darda radiallahu anhu, he became the fostered brother of Salman al-Farisi. Salman al-Farisi radiallahu anhu notices the wife of Abu Darda radiallahu anhu. She took no interest in dressing, no interest in any appearance, no interest in food or anything else. So he asked her, what is the problem? So she answered him saying, you know, your brother Abu Darda, he finds no need in this world, nothing, nothing at all, which means he's not interested in his wife. So Salman al-Farisi waited for Abu Darda at night. And when the night started, he began to read long salah. Salman stopped him and told him, do you know what? Go and sleep. So he went to sleep. A little while later, he got up again. He says, go to sleep. A little while later, he got up again. He says, go to sleep. And when the third of the night was remaining, Salman got him up and said, now if you want to pray, you may pray. Then he said, oh Abu Darda, remember, your body has a right over you. Your wife has a right over you. Your family has a right over you. Everything has a right over you. You must fulfill the rights of absolutely everything. And you don't have to overdo it when it comes to acts of worship of this nature. So Abu Darda radiallahu anhu listened to him because he was knowledgeable. But he went to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and said, Hey, this is what happened between me and Salman. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Salman has spoken the truth. You must fulfill the rights of your family members and understand that too is an act of worship. May Allah make us from amongst those. Salman al-Farisi at some stage became the Amir of Madain. Madain is an area in Iraq and he was the Amir but he did not change at all. The stipend he used to get on a monthly basis made up of approximately 5,000 coins, he used to give it all away. When they came to build a house for him, they knew that this man does not want a big house. So he asked the builder, what type of a house will you build for me? The builder says, something that will shade you from the sun, protect you from the cold. When you stand up, it will hit your head. And when you lie down, it will hit your feet. That's how small it will be. He says, yes, now you know me. That's the house. And that is what they built for him. And he was the Amir of Madain. On one instance, he went out and there was a man who had come from a sham. And what happened is that man was carrying belongings and, and a lot of goods. So so Salman al-Farisi radiallahu anhu was the Amir, but they did not know this. He offered to help the man and he started carrying the goods. And this man says, oh, thank you very much. Jazakumullah khair and what have you. And as they're walking, they met a group of men who greeted him as the Amir, the governor of Madain. And they told him, assalamu alaykum, oh Amir. So this man from Asham looks, he says, who's the Amir? They looked, they said, the man who's carrying your goods, subhanallah. This was Salman al-Farisi, a simple man. It is reported that Subhanallah, one day he was cooking and baking. So the visitors came to his house and they said, where is your girl, the girl who works for you? He said, no, we sent her to do another task. And I am a person who does not give two tasks to the same person. They will do one thing at a time. May Allah grant us goodness. On his deathbed, he was crying. And when he was crying, Subhanallah, he asked for something. 
and his wife brought it to him. In it, there was musk. He said, when I die, I want you to spray this musk on me because the angels who come to take us, they love a good fragrance. He passed away in Al-Mada'in and he was buried very near to Baghdad. Up to this day, his grave is there. He passed away approximately at the age of late 70s, some say 78 years old at the time uh, of Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. And it is reported that Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu attended the janazah. Wallahu alam, Allah knows best. But this was our hero, Salman al-Farisi radiallahu anhu. May Allah grant us a good lesson.